If you would pause the video. Copy it down. <coughs> the final thing that we're going to go over in our mole unit is actually a flashback to formulas. So far, all of the formula talk that we've done has been nomenclature, using the ionic covalent acidic rules to write formulas, which is incredibly important. But there's another angle by which you can get those formulas, and it has to do with the mole data that we've been talking about in this unit. You can come up with two groupings, categories of formulas using percent compositions, which we went over last week, how to find percent compositions. So before I show you the skill, we've got the vocab to get over. So looking at the screen, empirical versus molecular is the two categories of formulas that I just didn't go into when we were first introducing formulas through nomenclature. So what's the difference? An empirical is a formula in its most reduced subscript ratio. Remember, the subscripts are the little numbers, right? So for it to be empirical, it simply means that the ratio, like in water on the screen, has to be in its simplest form. See how this is a two to one ratio? A two to one ratio using the subscripts? It couldn't be simplified to smaller whole numbers in any way whatsoever. This is as simple as a two to one ratio can get. Therefore, water is empirical. The other one on the screen is the N5C3. All right, so we got pentanitrogen tricarbide. But again, if you turn the subscripts into a ratio, all right, and you can write it like this if you prefer to not use the colon, but it, it couldn't be simplified into simpler terms, all right? I mean, you could divide five by three on your calculator, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about dividing both of these by the same number and still getting whole numbers. It can't happen in this compound because N5C3 is empirical. A molecular formula is the opposite. It's where it's not in its simplest form. The screen says glucose, as you know, is C6H12O6. And if we write those subscripts as a ratio, it becomes 6 to 12 to 6. And this can very clearly be reduced because what number can all three of those be divided by? Three's not bad, but six is better, right? If you're gonna divide it into its smallest ratio, you can divide all of them by six. Now, you can divide them both by three and both by two, um, in which case it would give you different versions of the formula, but that the whole idea is that this must be molecular because there's at least one way to simplify. But anyway, yeah, if we divided all of them by six, then the new ratio would be one to two to one, which means this is molecular because it can be simplified, but the empirical version of it would be C H2, whoa, H2O. Right. And all I did was I, I just took the reduced version of it and stuck it back into the formula. So then this would be molecular, while this would be empirical. Let's see if this has made sense.
Aspen's in play. Let's go to cluster four, seat three. Hey, four, three. Is your guess empirical or molecular based on the connection between those values? The guess is molecular. Do you agree or disagree? It's definitely molecular because the ratio here is three to 12. What number can they both be divided by to give you more whole numbers? They can both be divided by three. All right. So three divided by three is one. 12 divided by three is four. So if you were asked to write an empirical version of this molecular formula, it would be CBR4. Empirical, oh, CO, sorry. I knew there was another thing I needed to add for the CO. I wanted to write a number. Anyway, empirical, molecular. Obviously. What if instead of asking to write an empirical version of this, I asked you to write a different molecular version of it? You could go bigger, right? Give me an example. Multiple of both by two. So what would that be? CO6, BR24. Look, I came up with another molecular version, right? By simply multiplying both of those by two, but it made the ratio stay the same, all right? So all of these are a one to four ratio, essentially. Empirical, molecular, molecular. Could I write another molecular? How many different molecular versions exist? An infinite, right? We can multiply it by three and then four and then five. So there's an infinite possibilities of molecular formulas here. How many empirical possibilities are there? One. One. That's it. This is the simplest ratio. One empirical. And then you could go on forever of different correct ratios of molecular. They do for ionics, because ionics are always in the simplest ratio. Covalents aren't. All right, um, that's the what of today, the concept. So that's important. You'll be asked questions about differentiating between empirical and molecular. The other half of today, though, is the calculation of it. Because again, using percent compositions, you can come up with different versions of the formula by studying the mole the way that we did last week. Take a look at the paper I handed out to you. For those of you at home, uh, if you don't have a copy of this, you could pause the video and get as much of that down as you can. But these are the steps that I'll be going over. Get a copy of it if you don't have a copy. You'll also need a periodic table. Now, here's the thing about these calculations. There's a lot of little steps. Do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, you're done. And none of the steps are hard. So the math is fine. It's very simple math. But here's the thing, my honors, beautiful children, is that you don't get the rules on the exam. So you've got seven days to be able to do what I'm about to show you without those rules. Now, it's a very natural progression of steps, though. So I'm not saying memorize them. I'm just saying practice enough to where you get good at this. And I have a lab coming up at the end of the week that's going to give you a lot of repetition, which is what you need for empirical molecular calculations. Are you ready? Do not copy the black, but do copy the green, please. Don't copy the black, do copy the green.
So I'm simply going to read through the steps here, and we'll first find an empirical. Follow along with me. Now, according to the data, we know that the compound, the formula we're looking for, is made up of CHN. C-H-N. What we don't know is the subscripts. Right? We don't know the little numbers that are missing there. Um, but we do have percentages. So I'm going to show you how the percent composition data directly will feed us to a formula. Read along with me. Here we go. Step one. It says divide the given percentages or masses. You can do this with mass values too. Divide the given percentages by the periodic masses of the elements. So here we go. I'll start with carbon and I'm going to divide the given percentage, which is 74.1, divided by his mass on the table. Now you have a periodic table on the back of the sheet I gave you. If you don't like flipping a lot though, then you can grab yours out, whatever. But I'm going to set this up for each of the three elements. Hydrogen's given percentage is 8.6 over his periodic mass. And nitrogen's percentage in this compound is given at 17.3 over his PT mass. You have a calculator, please click and play along. Get your thumbs the practice. <coughs> Sig figs do not play much role in any part of today. Just draw out two numbers passed in some cases. We'll be doing whole numbers in other cases. See if you're cool with my red numbers. <coughs> cool, we've done step one. Step two, reading says, divide each of the answers of step one, which are the red numbers, by the smallest of those numbers. A little weird, but the smallest number I got there was 1.23. It says divide all of them by that number. See if you're cool with my orange numbers, and I'll talk about why I dropped the decimals. I didn't warn you of this, but here's the deal. The numbers you get at the end of this step are 
technically supposed to be the missing empirical subscripts, which means they can't have decimals because subscripts don't do that. So the five, the seven, and the one are going to be the numbers we're going to say are the missing empirical subscripts. However, look back at your rules. Look back at the paper because there's a little side rule that does not apply here, but you need to be aware of. Here's what it says. It says that if any of these numbers at the end of this step on the calculator end in 0 0.4, 0 0.5, or 0 0.6, like none of these did that. They ended in 0 0.0, 0 0.9, and just one. All right, so I rounded them and we moved on. All right, so it doesn't happen here, but if any of them would have ended in 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, then you would have multiplied all of them by two before assigning them. It'll happen in our next problem so you can see it happen, but it's kind of a coin toss on whether it happens or not. But none of them ended in those decimals on your calculator, so they are the missing values. So five, seven, one. So five, seven, one. And hooray, we have an empirical formula for CHN here. Five to seven to one couldn't be simplified anymore, so it reiterates the definition. <clears throat> now, some of the Canvas questions will just ask for an empirical, in which case, that's the answer. But it could ask for a molecular. Look at the molecular rules on the paper. And you'll notice that step one of the molecular says calculate the empirical. So if you run into a question that says, what's the molecular? You have to do this first because step one is find the empirical. But we've already done that. So let's pretend that this question wanted us to find the molecular. And we will uh, just keep going. So we've already done step one. There's the empirical. Step two says find the molar mass of the empirical. Now, you know how to find molar mass. We did that last week. Find the molar mass of the empirical. So what does that mean? Well, we know that carbon has a mass of 12.01, but there's five of them. We know that hydrogen has a mass of 1.008, but there's seven of them. And we know that nitrogen has a mass of 14.01, only one of them. This is a shorthand of the molar mass steps. You can make your long list if you still need to. I just hope you're getting faster, but see if you can find five carbons, seven hydrogens, one nitrogen. What does it add up to? I get 81.12 grams per mole as the total mass of five carbon, seven hydrogens, one nitrogen. We did all right? You're allowed to ask questions. You'll are very quiet. <clears throat> all right. Next step, just following our rules. It says to divide the given molar mass. Now, Look back at the screen. There's a number we haven't used yet. It gave us a value on the screen of 160 as a given molar mass. So read it carefully because you cannot invert these numbers. And a lot of y'all want to. 
it says divide the given molar mass by the empirical molar mass. All right, so I'm going to divide the number on the screen, which is 160, divided by the molar mass of the empirical. And this step has to give you a whole number. I mean, it might not. You have to round it. But the answer to this step will always be almost right on top of a number because mathematically and logistically it has to be. Two, yeah, 160 divided by 80 is gonna be two. <clears throat> One step left. The last step reads, multiply your empirical subscripts by that number. The empirical subscripts you got earlier, multiply all of them by that number, and you've got your molecular species. So if I, if I do them all by two, I will get C10H14 N2 as the molecular answer. What you think? Let's do another one. We'll draw some cards this time. I've got new data for us to start with. Last example of the day, and it looks like we are making a magnesium nitrogen compound, right? But we don't know the subscript. So let's say that the question wants us to find molecular. What is the molecular? Step one, find the empirical. So let's start working on it. Back to your list, let's check it out. It says step one is to divide the given percentages by the PT masses. Let's get some help. Let's go over to cluster two. C2, A22, what's the mass of magnesium on the table? 24.3 is right. And we did nitrogen last time already. But his given percentage this time is All right, let's go over to cluster five. Talk to seat three. Hey, five, three, what should I do with those green numbers? No. You got ahead of yourself. Look at step two. Divide by the smallest of those numbers, which in this case is 1.98. So divided. So careful, right? Don't get your steps mixed up. Round. 
Last time at this step, these pink numbers were the missing subscripts. All we did was assign them to the positions and we were done with the empirical. But we have the side rule that if any of them end in a 0 0.4, 0 0.5, or 0.6, you multiply all of them by two. So if, if it happens to one of them, all of them get affected. Do you see the 0.5? All right, last time I didn't put decimals up there because we were at point zeros and point nines. All right, so I just rounded those. All right, but we've got one that qualifies. So multiply everything by two. Now we have our empirical subscripts that I can put in the proper places, three and two. Ask again. Yeah, no, that won't always happen. And yeah, yeah, and you'll have more complex um, formulas too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just the tenths place. If the tenths place has a four, five, or six in it. It doesn't matter because when you multiply it by two, then you're going to hit something that's a point zero. Maybe with more numbers, but then it'll be a whole number that can go here. Tenth place is all we care about. Forget about what the other digits say. No, 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 no. Because the green, no, none of that gets rounded. That this right here is still a part of the divide by the smallest number. So we are, we're not even. We don't even have our radar on yet. No, no, that's what I'm saying, because the orange one is connected to this right here. You identified the smallest number and you divided by the smallest number. You cannot round any earlier than the pink stuff. Now, that's the empirical, but we are pretending we need the molecular, so let's keep going. After finding the empirical, next in the molecular, we need the molar mass of the empirical. Find it. I'm going to draw a card. Find the molar mass of Mg3N2 magnesium nitride. We are finding the empirical molar mass right now. We're going to go to cluster five again and talk to seat one. We found both of y'all. It's exciting. Hey, five one, do you have a molar mass? Perfect. Yeah, I get 100.92. All right, that's three magnesiums and two nitrogens. You cool? Awesome. See if you can finish. There are two steps left in the process. Look at your rules or the previous example. Find the molecular formula.
Remember, there's a number on the screen you haven't used yet. Um, yes, sir. Step three of molecular says to divide the given molar mass, which is on the screen. It's 404. Divide the given molar mass by the molar mass of the empirical. All right. You cannot invert those numbers. And it has to give you a whole number no matter what. In this case, it gives you the number four. So then your final, final step is to multiply the empirical subscripts by that whole number. And now you have a molecular answer that includes 12 magnesiums and eight nitrogens. I hope it is. Questions? That's it. We're done. We're done. We're done.